It's time for TNT. Leo Laporte back again in the chair for Mr. Michael Elgin, who will be back next week. Coming up, a record quarter and record year for Apple. We'll get some analysis. We'll take a look at the NSA's approval of the uh, Samsung Knox platform. Is that good or bad for Samsung? And Nielsen's come to podcasting. It's all coming up next on TNT. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, October 21st, 2014. This episode brought to you by Lynda.com. Lynda is an easy and affordable way to help you learn instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on business, software, web development, graphic design, and more. For a free trial, visit Lynda.com slash TNT. That's L-Y-N-D-A.com slash TNT. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, or other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the news from with the, the journalists who report it. Welcome. I'm Leo Laporte filling in for Mike Elgin. He's got the week off. Jason Howell has not. Hell, that's right. I'm here all week. <laughs> Thank you. Help, helping you to hold the sh uh, ship together. The what together? No, never yes. mind. I, I, by the obviously, way, I have more edit to do to later today. <laughs> and by the way, this is the only show on the Twit Network with a stereo theme. <laughs> nice. I think we owe that. Oh, you owe it to uh, you, Jason. You right? know, it's the twenty first century, right? Also, Soon it's going to have to be five point one. I'm just saying. <laughs> Surround sound. Yeah. Also here, content czar <laughs> for After Nines, as always on Tuesday, Joe Panettiere, Mister Bread you? Earth. Right? Is that what that means? <laughs> there you go, Joe Bread Earth. Yeah, just about. Yeah. Uh, bread. A uh, Panettiere bread man. Let's mm. go with bread man now. Yes. Oh, absolutely. you're, oh, or, you're or, a Panettiere. You bring me the bread. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm known to share the bread, but not all of it. I'll tell you who got the bread, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. Apple's quarterly and fiscal year report. Amazing. Earnings week continues. IBM and Apple reported yesterday. Today, it's Yahoo's turn. Marissa Meyer will discuss her turnaround plans for Yahoo right after the closing bell this afternoon. Meanwhile, uh, Joe has the story. Uh, what a year and what a quarter for Apple. Yeah, what a year, what a quarter. But I think the most impressive thing, Leo, is the fact that Apple stock is still rising on the news. Very often, a company will put out record earnings, record uh, revenues, and the stock will fall because Wall Street starts to get worried about the fact that there's no way to maintain that momentum. In this case, shares are actually up today. Last I saw, maybe about 3%, 2.5% uh, on Wall Street, nearing a 52-week high for Apple. And basically, Wall Street is saying, not only do we like the current quarter, but we love uh, Apple's outlook. Now, here to give us some more perspective on the earnings and where Apple is going is ZDNet's Larry Dignan. Larry, you around for us? Yeah, I'm here. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Larry. Hey, now, once you saw the earnings, what were your uh, immediate reactions? Well, the, I mean, the immediate one was the thing everybody looked at, which was like, holy iPhone, Batman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> They moved a lot of units. They're going to move a lot more. And then once China comes online, you know, that, that thing, that thing's a juggernaut for sure. Um, no, no, but the main thing that stuck out for me is just the max sales. Um, mm -hmm. isn't, that, isn't that amazing? Of, isn't that amazing it, that the desktop it, and it, laptops it, business are not, is not dead? Yeah. And they're, I mean, in terms of units, they were up 21% from a year ago. In terms of revenue, they were up 18%. Um, back to school was really strong for them, which isn't all that surprising. I mean, you go to any college, it's, it's, it's all Apple everywhere. Yeah. Um, but the thing that was most notable for me as far as the future goes is, you know, they also said max sales were strong in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And there were a few things that stuck out for me there. One was a emerging markets count for like a quarter of Apple sales now. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of growth there. The other important part about the emerging markets is that they're mobile first areas, right? right? So you really have kind of a green field for that halo effect that Apple talks about. These are people who are buying iPhones, iPads, and they're obviously looking at Macs. Um, and the historical argument for Mac or against Mac is that Macs are expensive, right? If you look at the new iMac, the, the big screen one, you know, 
it, it, it plays true to script. But, you know, MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs are selling well in emerging markets. And I don't know if that means they're viewed more as a luxury good or that the price is right. I mean, the MacBook Air is not terribly expensive. Um, hey, but if Larry, they can ride we, that market, it's all good. Larry, I was, uh, yeah, Larry, I was going to ask, does this actually mean that Apple is growing its market share versus the PC? Or are, just, are sales just rising across the board in the PC and Mac market and, and rising tides lift all boats? Well, if you look at if you look at PC growth overall, I mean, you get to like two percent growth, and we're all doing car wheels because the market's not collapsing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so there, I mean, the Mac is outpacing the PC industry by a wide margin, and and I think they said that they had the most market share since 1995 in terms of the Mac. That's um, right, but it's still single digit. I mean, it's not a big player when you oh, compare it to all those Windows machines out there. Oh, not, not at all. Um, but it's also the same, it's the same argument with Android and iOS, right? iOS is in the market share leader, but they make a lot of dough. <laughs> um, yeah, Apple doesn't you know, really need to be number one in market share as long as they <laughs> number one in profit and yeah. sales are growing. Right. Right. But, but I think the, I think the thing that also sticks out for me and Mac is, you know, you look at, I think if anyone flashed back, if anybody went back in time six years ago and said, all right, which unit is going to be part of the other category? Like what product category is going to become irrelevant to Apple? Most of us will probably look back to Mac. Right. And instead the iPods go into the other revenue category, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, for, for Mac, you got, you got to give Mac props just for longevity in a lot of ways. And I think yep. once they... Once they knit OS 10 or OS X with um, iOS, and, you know, because already the look and feel is starting to blend together, and, and they're doing many, a lot more things to sort of connect, create connected tissue between those operating systems. I mean, I, I think you know Mac, Mac and iPhone sales may go hand in hand, um, mm. and if that's the case, Apple's going to have a, you know, it won't be a market share killer, but it's certainly going to be a you know, it's going to be a very profitable, nice business. If there was a um, negative in the results this quarter, of course, it was this third down quarter for the iPad. Tim Cook was at great pains in the analyst call to say, no, I'm still bullish on the iPad, and partly because of the growth in emerging markets. Yeah, well, I think the iPad story is, A, an emerging markets thing, but I think the real thing for the iPad is it's, it's a corporate thing. I mean, I don't think we're going to look at I still look at the eyes like when I when I travel, the tablet's the first thing that gets voted off the island. Right. Mm. You know, it gets voted it gets voted off the backpack. Right. And I need a laptop for work. I need obviously I need the smartphone. And then I'll pack a Kindle to read. But the the tablet's what gets booted. So it's like a cleaner kind of thing. But I think in corporations it'll wind up replacing a laptop in a lot of, for a lot of workers. Tim also um, said Cook also said we don't, it's a new product category, so we don't know what the turnover rate is. You know, we know phones right. are every other year, PCs maybe every four years, but we don't yet know how fast people need a new iPad. And I think part of the sales drop is saturation. Everybody's got an iPad, and they're not rushing to market every year to get a new one. Yeah, well, I, th I, think it's, I think it's saturation. I think it's also, the tablets are built pretty well, mm -hmm. right? It's not like they, they don't exactly. implode. Yeah, you don't need yeah, to know I, 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 am, I am the poster child for this conversation. Uh, when the iPad came out, we bought two, one for me, one for the family. Um, and just last week, I finally got the iPhone 6 Plus, and I still have those two original iPads. They're, you know, they're, they're workhorses. They're fine. I love reading on them. But uh, to Larry's point, they're not coming on business trips with me anymore. I've, I've got my iPhone with the massive screen, and I've got my MacBook. I think it's interesting, though, Larry, that you feel like business might turn its back on, uh, on say, the Surface and Windows tablets and buy iPads instead? Well, I, I think it, I think the, in the enterprise, the device, the device conversation is going to depend on what you need, right? So if I'm on the sales floor, unless I have, you know, Windows apps in the background that, you know, somehow you need Surface, the iPad or a, you know, or a cheap Android one is probably going to be fine. Right, but I mean, I see more iPads in the field now as cash registers and yeah. kiosks yeah. Right. than ever. 
right? And, and part of that's, you know, and I imagine Apple Pay may accelerate that. But for now, I mean, Square has enabled a lot of iPads in the field. And I just, you know, with the deal with IBM, I mean, I think that's, I think that's ultimately where Apple's going to get its volume for the iPad. I mean, I don't think the iPad's dead, but I do see it much more as a, a business tool than necessarily some personal device that you, you know, have some form of intimacy with. Because uh, I think that'll be reserved for your phone, which increasingly has a big ass screen attached to it. You know, I'm flashing back to the uh, the Windows 10 announcement in San Francisco, and and that was all enterprise focused. And you you almost wonder when when Microsoft did that announcement, the Windows 10 announcement, if they did it because they were scared of this very phenomenon you're talking about, Larry, and also the fact that Apple's working with IBM. It's 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 almost like. Microsoft knows it has a stronghold in the enterprise, but they're really worried about this uh, this mobile Apple phenomenon uh, chipping away at that empire. Well, I think they're worried about it a little, but I mean, I think the reality is Microsoft is an enterprise company. Um, mm -hmm. You look at who's carrying the team, it's Windows Server, it's Azure, Dynamics. It, you know, there, there's all this, you know, I mean, we look at Surface and you know, Lumia and Windows Phone, but the reality is they, they're dominant in the enterprise, and that's what brings home all the money. Um, so I think Microsoft has two ways to play it. One, obviously they want to be a device player, and, you know, they want to be that endpoint, but I think the game for Microsoft is managing those endpoints, right? Mm -hmm. So Microsoft could be perfectly happy with their enterprise mobility suite managing a bunch of iPhones and Blackberries and Android devices and, yeah, maybe a few Windows Phone devices too. But the game, I think the game is to control the data, secure the data, and manage those devices mm -hmm. and applications, much more than the device itself. Apple's making yeah. another move uh, in the App Store, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Joe and Larry says it's a big move for business. Also coming up. Fort Knox, but first a word from Lynda.com. Thank you, Larry. Hang on for a sec, if you will, so we could talk about that 64-bit story. Lynda, of course, is the place we go to learn how to use things like our, our editing software. We just moved from uh, Final Cut to Premiere. Where else would you go but uh, Lynda.com to train our editors? Lynda.com courses are produced at a very high quality. These aren't, you know, homemade videos on YouTube. And they have the best instructors who are real experts in the field. Courses are broken into bite-sized pieces. You can learn at your own pace. You can learn from start to finish. They have uh, uh, transcripts, too, so you can search them and find exactly the tip or trick you're trying to find and jump right to that part of the video. There's even certificates of course completion you can publish to your LinkedIn profile. That's nice. One of the best things about lynda.com is you pay once each month, and you have access to every single one of those thousands of of courses on lynda.com with new courses each and every day. Whether you're a beginner or an advanced user, lynda.com has a course for you. You can even learn on the go with lynda.com apps for iPhone, iPod. I'm sorry, iPad. They don't have iPod courses. And <laughs> maybe they have iPod Touch courses and Android. 25 bucks a month, unlimited access to over 100,000 tutorials, premium plan. Members can get uh, those courses downloaded to their mobile devices so you can watch them on the plane. You can also download project files, practice along with the instructor. Hey, if you're interested in photography, nowhere better than lynda.com. They've got courses that cover the basics like composition and exposure. Lisa's taking those right now. And she's also taking a Lightroom course, intermediate courses on lighting, enhanced photographs in uh, Photoshop and GIMP, advanced tutorials on color correction, mastering the Adobe Creative Cloud. And I love Bert Monroy's Dreamscape series. If you remember Bert from the Screensavers, he's the best. For any software you rely on and business skills too, lynda.com will help you stay current. We've got a special deal for you. All the courses free for the next week. A seven-day trial awaits at lynda.com slash TNT. That's lynda.com slash TNT. Try it free for the next week. Leo Laporte filling in for Mr. Mike Elgin. He's on vacation, getting his son married off in Jordan. He'll be back next week. Uh, for years, government and security-conscious businesses uh, chose BlackBerry to protect their information. I don't know what they do now, but perhaps Samsung has an alternative. Samsung can now offer the data security that even the NSA trusts. They announced that their mobile security platform, Knox, has received NSA approval for use by U.S. government officials who carry classified information. The Galaxy S5, S4, Note 4, Note 3, and the 10.1 Note tablet were certified by the NSA. 
along with something I've never heard of. Joe, do you know what Boeing's black phone is? Is that from Boeing uh, Aircraft? I don't know if Boeing uh, does sort of a rugged and or uh, custom OEM version. With wings. Of, uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, yeah, this is, yes. this is the super secure Android uh, phone, the That's black phone. That's not the Boeing no? phone, though. Oh, it's, this is, oh, this is different. That's a black phone. Yeah. And I don't think the NSA trusts that one. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, fair I'm enough. pretty sure that's not the one they're talking about. Yeah. You oh, know, it's, you it's interesting. I got you. Certainly, certainly good news here overall for Samsung, but uh, particularly in the government market. But think of the irony here. Say you're a CIO is. or yeah, a customer in a non-government market. If you're that customer in a non-government market, it's, it, does this type of endorsement actually scare you to hear that there's a sort of a <laughs> NS, NSA-approved device? It ain't the seal of approval it once was, <laughs> yeah. is it? Yeah, no. I mean, just plug into our spying immediately with this NSA-approved uh, device. But, you know, kidding aside, Leo, I, I, I think uh, one thing that a lot of people overlook with Samsung, so many people get focused on device sales as well as Android itself. Samsung actually has a pretty big office space out in New Jersey. It's just outside of Manhattan. And they're showing off technologies such as this, the uh, the Knox technology. And then there's all this vertical market software that Samsung has developed for, for government, for retail, for uh, financial services, and the list goes on. So it, it's almost like Samsung is very quietly developing vertical market applications that will pull their devices into each vertical. So I'm very intrigued by what they're up here with Knox. This is clearly a battleground because, of course, remember a couple of months ago, Apple announced a deal with IBM to put yep. IBM apps on mobile. So yes. it's it's partly security, but also partly capabilities. I'm looking at this Boeing black handset. It detects tampering and will self-destruct if, <laughs> if, if somebody nice. tries to break into it. And, quote, there are no serviceable parts, and any attempted servicing or replacing of parts would destroy the product. So there you go. That also has NSA approval. I think that's important. I think... Uh, if you, even if you're a small business, the notion that government trusts this with their top secret stuff is, is probably helps you uh, make that decision. Apple's making the big case for privacy and security. It seems sensible that Samsung would, too. Joe has the uh, next story. Joe? Yeah, you know, um, this next story reminds me a little bit of Microsoft back in the 1990s and then more recently with their their transitions from 16 to 32 and then 64-bit. Now Apple is, is making that type of uh, transition, particularly with their App Store. So going forward by uh, February 1st of next year, software developers uh, with their new App Store submissions – it's going to have to be 64-bit apps, which hmm. is very interesting. It, I think it, the good news is there's already an SDK out, so developers can get started on this immediately. It sounds to me that, like there's also investment protection here. It's not like suddenly 32-bit apps are turned off or the whole world has to make this massive upgrade. So hopefully Apple's going to give you the best of both worlds here. 64-bit performance with the newer apps coming out, but investment protection with the 32-bit apps. We'll see. Uh, Larry, does that mean uh, more of a business market, too, for the uh, iPhone? Is 64-bit important to business? Yeah, well, I, I mean, if you look at the iPad deal or the Apple deal with IBM, I mean, the promise is that they're going to have all these analytical apps coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, you know, Salesforce and their analytics cloud, you look at, you know, a lot of the business-focused apps are going to be very analytics rich UI type, type apps, and 64-bit just plays better to that crowd. It means more RAM as well. Apple traditionally hasn't put a lot of RAM in their iOS devices. They say, we don't need it. Um, High-end Android phones are now putting in 3 gigs of RAM, but that's kind of the ceiling if you're a 32-bit operating system. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that'll have to be worked out. But, but I do think, you know, I think it's a good move. you got to push these guys along at some point. Um, and you Apple, know, currently, you know, Apple's the only mobile platform with 64-bit processors. Qualcomm's 64-bit processor is not out quite yet, to my knowledge. I think yeah, so. so I think it's a, it's a marketing, you know, it could be a marketing advantage. Right. Uh, although I don't think, you know, I don't, I don't think you're going to pitch mom or somebody or your cousin on, hey, 64-bit stuff. <laughs> I mean, over, right? No, you just fly. tell mom it's twice as good as 32-bit. Yeah, but if you can show them what 64-bit apps can do right. compared to 32, and, you know, I think the best way to do that is probably show them some really snazzy video games. Yeah. Um, but, you know, from a business perspective, I, I mean, 
I, you know, I, I think it'll help the analytics apps. Um, the other thing is 64 apps, 64 bit apps are also more secure. Yeah. Right. So there's a whole, you know, th there's a bunch of reasons to do it. And I think if Apple can do things that other platforms can't because it's 64 bit first, then they should run with that advantage. 64 bits. Uh, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's just because it won't last forever, right? Right. So that's we'll exactly what it. I was about to say. 64 bit is absolutely coming to the Android side, not only Qualcomm, but uh, the new NVIDIA Tegra K1 chip. The current version is 32 bit, but the 64 bit's just around the corner. And uh, Chromebooks will have it. And uh, uh, so apparently will the Nexus 9, Google's next uh, tablet. Yeah. And, and I, think if, I think if you're a developer, I don't think you're even too wound up about the move. Right, because you know you're going to have to do it. Because most iOS developers probably also develop for Android. Right, and Xcode and, handles it know, automatically. You just check a button. I'm sure. You know, if if I'm a developer, I'm probably excited by this because it's it's an artificial timeline. It's it, it's a, a line in the sand uh, where the store moves 64 bit in terms of hey, if I'm going to be submitting right. new apps now it's 64 bit. Now I'm inspiring a whole new wave of upgrades among my right. user base. Ah, oh, good point. Good point. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a move that it just makes sense on so many levels. Larry Dignan, editor-in-chief of ZDNet, so great to talk to you. Be nice to Mary Jo Foley. I'm always nice to her. <laughs> <laughs> He's Mary Jo's boss, and we love her. She's on Windows Weekly. Sorry, sorry, Larry? I said she's one of my favorite people, so I'm always nice to her. Me too. Let's share a beer next time we're in New York. Thank you, Larry. All right, thanks a lot. Take care. Our next story uh, goes to Hollywood. Todd Spangler joins us. He's Variety's uh, digital editor. Uh, Variety magazine, of course, covers uh, the biz of entertainment and had the story today that uh, TV ratings giant Nielsen is going to join forces with a name we know, Adobe, to create a rating system for all kinds of digital content, including online video, blog posts, games, even podcasts. The service will launch next year. They've already signed programmers like ESPN, Sony, Turner, Univision, and Viacom. The real question is, will advertisers take to it? Todd Spangler joins us now from New York. Hi, Todd. Hey, how are you? Welcome. Great. So is this a move to... What? What is? <laughs> why is Nielsen getting into this business? I guess that's the first question. Well, they want to uh, provide all forms of measurement across all platforms for their clients who, you know, don't exclusively deal in TV or the web or mobile. So they want to provide a harmonized view of everything across all platforms. I noticed that the first people they've signed up are, in fact, TV programmers who are comfortable right. with Nielsen, no Nielsen, uh, but also have digital assets. And, and is it this going to be the same kind of numbers uh, will it be apples to apples when they uh, sell those numbers? Well, that's the idea is that this will be a consistent uh, metric that you can compare across all forms of digital consumption. Again, this is separate and apart from the Nielsen TV ratings, right. which we all know and uh, either love or don't love. Actually, Nielsen's been a little bit of uh, trouble lately for uh, kind of making some, some mistakes in there. Uh, rating system, but it's not like there's any competition, is there? Well, there's growing competition from uh, other firms like Rentrack, uh, which is uh, beefing up its capabilities in this area. So, uh, you know, they're not uh, they're not the only game in town here. But um, uh, Nielsen is definitely trying to provide as many. Uh, data points as they can across different um, consumption patterns. What is, what is Adobe's role in this? Well, they operate a large video distribution network. And so um, the thinking or the theory is that they will provide a uh, close to census level uh, measurement of what people are doing on the Internet in terms of what they watch and what they consume in terms of digital content across different um, uh, types of content. Census level means counting everybody as opposed to some sort of statistical measure. Right. But they, but everything isn't on Adobe's platform. 
No, really? that's that. That's correct. They're extrapolating because it, they okay. can't okay. they can't reach mm -hmm. every single person on every single device. So there is some, you know, mathematics involved um, in terms of what they can uh, assume people are doing on which device on which platform, but. Um, the theory is that um, Adobe has a pretty broad base of, uh, at least in terms of the TV programmers who are distributing content online, uh, they can measure uh, a lot of what consumers are doing right. in terms of watching their stuff online and uh on different types of devices. I'll tell you why this caught my eye. Of course, we're an IPTV network. We can't get ratings. We have to count our own downloads and viewers. Right. Will this apply to independents as well? That's the idea is that any, um, any content provider can opt into this program yeah. and uh, get uh, verified ratings on what kinds of content are being consumed on uh, all the different properties. Hey, hey Todd, let me ask you a, a question that may be a stretch. So a few weeks ago or a few days ago, I, I forget how many weeks it has been, Facebook announced this new ad tracking platform. Now, near term, it seems like this Nielsen move and the Facebook moves are completely unrelated. But long term, do you think these two organizations are on a collision course in terms of tracking the performance of content? Well, in fact, Facebook is working with Nielsen on a separate product uh, that tracks uh, the advertising impressions hmm. of okay. online content. So they're already working together, and um, you would expect that to continue. This is uh, specifically on the programming, uh, the content, not the advertising that appears on digital channels. But, of course, advertisers have to embrace it. I mean, ultimately, the reason you want these numbers is so you can sell ads. Right. Yeah, and we don't know exactly at this point because they just announced this program. We don't know um, how enthusiastically the big agencies or the big marketers are going to opt into this, um, how much they will trust it. Uh, so they will, uh, you know, have to weigh in and uh, explain what this means for them as the uh, weeks go forward here. Todd Spangler is New York digital editor for Variety Magazine. You could follow him on Twitter at xpangler, x-p-a-n-g-l-e-r.com. Todd, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Another coming-of-age moment for a new media, I think, when you see Nielsen uh, getting involved, Joe. We're going to take a break. When we come back... In other news today, first a word from our friends at Gazelle. There are a lot of new products. I just got the Galaxy Note 4. going to review that a little later on on Before You Buy. You're starting to look at your phone thinking, boy, that's awfully small. That's awfully old. <laughs> the, <laughs> that's, I want a new one. Well, what are you going to do with the old one? Throw it in a drawer, let it gather dust? That's like putting cash. That's like putting $100 bills in a drawer and forgetting about it. Gazelle will turn your old hardware into cold, hard bucks. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot com. Sell your old phone, your iPhone, your iPad, your Samsung phone. Your black They buy Blackberries. They don't give you much money, but they buy Blackberries. <laughs> Actually, top dollar, even for broken iPhones. Bro Look at that, 245 bucks for your old iPhone 4, 5S. That is a great deal. I can tell you, uh, from personal experience, we had an iPhone 4 we sent in. They quoted us, I think, 30 bucks. They sent us 120 bucks. They said, no, it's got more memory and it's in better shape than you said. Whoa, what company does that, Gazelle? No wonder over a million customers have gone to Gazelle and they've received more than $170 million. Your offer is locked in for 30 days. That's good news. That gives you time to decide if you want to buy it to get the new product, to transfer your data, to set up your device. And then you say, okay, send me the box. They pay the postage. You send you a box. You pile all your gadgets into it. And then they turn it around fast. Cash, uh, a check, PayPal, if you wish, or... If you're an Amazon fan like I am, get the Amazon gift card. They bump the value of that 5%, so it makes it easy. See, I have two Note 3s, each of them worth 195 Well, flaw what about good? They're not flawless. 180 bucks. I'll take it. Yeah. That's 360 bucks. 
Gazelle.com. Try it today. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. What is your old phone or tablet or surface worth? Go to Gazelle.com to find out. In other news today, Facebook suing the lawyers of Paul Celia. You may remember Celia sued the social network in 2010, claiming he was entitled to 84% of the company. His claim was dismissed after Facebook alleged he had forged the documents, proving ownership. Now Facebook's going back to court. They're going after his lawyers, saying they, quote, knew or should have known the lawsuit was a fraud, end quote. Celia is also scheduled to appear in May on criminal charges that he forged the ownership documents. Oops. World Series opens tomorrow. I'm a little excited about this in Kansas City. If you're lucky enough to be going to a game at Kauffman Stadium in KC or uh, AT&T Park here in San Francisco, bring your iPhone. Stadium concessions will be the first professional sports facilities to accept Apple Pay thanks to a deal with MasterCard. But you can't use American Express. MLB will also support Apple Pay for online ticket sales for the 2015 season if you're not going to the World Series. Sorry about that. And if you've been hoping to buy a One Plus One phone but haven't been able to get an invite, or maybe you've just been disinclined to participate in the come times and the company's sometimes controversial competitions. Some good news. OnePlus is going to open to public pre-orders October 27th, just six days from now. The so-called flagship killer Android phone is very inexpensive, $300 to $350. Uh, we've, we've all played with it and love mm -hmm. it. I used it for months. But uh, the company says it will continue to be in short supply. So you might want to get in line. I'm in that Sophie's Choice moment right now where I'm like, do I continue with the OnePlus One? <laughs> Or do I shell out big dollars for the Nexus 6? I just don't know what to do. They're both so good. You know, I hate to throw, do this to you, but the, the Note 4 is pretty good. Too. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> cool. Now it's three. Samsung fixed all the things I hate. Well, I'm going to save that for oh, you yeah, save later, it, save it. later today. What do you carry, Joe Panettiere? I, <laughs> I'm glad you're asking me Do you have that today. Boeing black phone? No, no, I'm really happy you're asking me today rather than last week. Because last week, I would have been embarrassed to tell you, I carried an iPhone Four. Oh, but Joe. It was, it, it, was, it was a personal long story. I carried it for good luck because I mentioned to you, we, our company got acquired uh, um, a few years ago, and that was the phone upon which uh, I negotiated my portion of the deal. You so didn't want to delete the text. Eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, but now that I've moved on and co-founded another company after nines, just last week, I got the uh, iPhone 6 Plus. So uh, I'm a happy camper. I've got the old one sort of stored frame away. It. I'll never, I'll just never put it in a frame. Absolutely. I'm putting put in a glass jar, absolutely. You could gazelle it. It might be worth True. as much as $30. I, yeah, you know, I, 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 can't, <laughs> I can't gazelle it. But, you know, I got it. I, one of the things I'm curious about, gazelle, I haven't been on it uh, yet today. Uh, what are they paying for uh, 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 Amazon Fire smartphones at this point? They do buy them. I think they do, do they? buy They buy Kindles, yeah. yeah. And the Kindle yeah. Fire. That Fire is pretty much a giveaway now. I think, aren't they giving it, yeah. uh, giving it away? Yeah. No fire H. No fire. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see here. I'm very curious to see. There are some phones that just don't have a reset. No fire HD 8.9. No, that's this tablet though. See the fire. Oh, phone. you're talking about the fire phone. Oh, fire I missed phone. that part. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Right. right. Do you have to pay them yeah, to not, take it? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't see yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think there. so. There's really no value to that. Yeah, they'd have a hard time selling that. I gave mine to John anyway. C. Dvorak. No, no lie. I don't know what he's doing with it. Probably using it as a doorstop. Seriously, speaking of framing phones, you should probably frame the Fire Phone because it will be a collectible someday. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Panettiere is content czar at uh, After Nines. It's so good to have you. So good to spend some time with you, Joe. Anything Same else here. you want to plug you. before we move along? I have one small thing to plug, actually. If you check our uh, website, afternines.com, we put up a teaser. Our next editorial reveal is on November 4th. So whatever I we're doing next, that. that next product or service will be November 4th. I saw that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, we'll thank see. you, Joe. Really appreciate it. All right, it. thank you. Take care. Take our, care. Twit, our, twit, our TNT fan of the day, Cola Cats. You know where he watches TNT? On his media PC with a 55-inch television and his feet wearing some very comfy moccasins, I might add, up on the table. How do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of your setup. Post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. But do use the hashtag, HowIWatchTNT, and we will find it. That's the tech news today. Thanks to Joe Panettiere for joining us. Thanks to you for being here. If you want to watch more TNT, you'll find it at twit.tv slash TNT and on Stitcher, on iTunes, on YouTube, on Feedly, our favorite podcatcher. Follow us on the Twitter at Tech News Today TV. 
except no substitutes. And join our Google Plus community. Your thoughts and opinions always appreciated at TNT at twit.tv. Thank you, Jason Howell. You bet, sir. Thank you to our great producers who did all the booking, Karsten Bondi yeah. and Tanya Hall. I'm Leo Laporte. Mike will be back in the saddle next week, but I will see you right here tomorrow on Tech News Today. Bye-bye.